about um, the U.S. over the past uh, 100 years or so, and, and this got me, what got me thinking is my local newspaper runs a community highlight section every, uh, every, every Sunday. And uh, what, what, what struck me this year is uh, it, it goes back 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, and uh, 100 years. So that's 1918, 1943, 1968, 1993, documenting a century of essentially final going continuous war somewhere on the planet. As well. So, um, and I, you know, some, some juicy comments about, you know, the, the flood low incident and the first fallen soldier from the wrong valley uh, resisting, you know, uh, uh, what was called in the paper, politically incorrect, undomination of Europe. And uh, the, the, the grieving in the section of, in, of the county and the local high school preparing victory clubs and of course, what's going on in, in Vietnam? Why is everybody attacking the the weather here? Uh, interesting stuff along with, you know, conditions of weather and the price of hogs, etc. But in this, I want to I think about the, is there a, a, a kind of contention between liberal and Ill illiberal cultures in the United States when thinking about uh, the U.S. Constitution? And Section 1 starts out, um, since I've been thinking a lot about this, the Trump administration over the past year, and uh, is, is apparently uh, what some people consider inept, and uh, allegedly what some people consider troubling efforts to govern the United States of America um, in accord with the oath he took to uh, preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. He may be doing it to the best of his abilities, uh, but due to, uh, you know, I think some intemperate threats to imprison his uh, opponent in the general election, uh, whinging in uh, various speeches about how Democrats who don't clap during the State of the Union ought to be in prison, um, threatening nuclear war perhaps, going back to EPA, not worry about security lapses in the White House, friction with the FBI, the D Department of Justice, and other things such as, the, such as this. It's often said that one wonders if Donald Trump is on the verge of triggering a constitutional crisis, and a constitutional crisis that would somehow be problematic. Well, this got me thinking about uh, Carl Schmitt and the parliamentary crisis of democracy, uh, and is there a parliamentary crisis of democracy? Thinking about the United States since 1989 at least, probably better since, uh, I would say, maybe, um, maybe 1998, I'm beginning to think, well, is it a, a, a parliamentary crisis of democracy or instead a, a parliamentary democracy of crisis that is, in a sense, creating a kind of uh, new understanding of what we might consider the fixed fundamental principles of the USA by which it is believed to be governed um, by some sort of calm and prudent authority. Is there behind that a more fluid but still foundational set of practices by which governance is actually being conducted and it's being recognized as being conducted in that way, but it's often obscured by this uh, crisis, you know, essentially ongoing crisis. Yep. Let's rewind the movie back 20 years. It's a Clinton impeachment. Um, you know, uh, tensions in the in the middle in the Middle East, Southwest Asia over Al Qaeda. You know, uh, missile attacks in Sudan, uh, warships being blown up, ultimately 9/11, uh, and then all of the horses are really uh, off to the races. So in uh, section two, I begin to wonder uh, if if we're really thinking about this and thinking about it in terms of a, a constitutional crisis, and if we, if we want to think about the preamble to the Constitution, is what's been going on for 20 years or 30 years really uh, the best way to go about uh, establishing justice, uh, perfecting a union, ensuring domestic tranquility, providing for a common defense, promoting the general welfare, and perhaps uh, securing some of the blessings of liberty if for 
only the citizens of the United States, but maybe everyone else as well. So pivoting off these kinds of uh, whatever, propensities, proclivities, possibilities, tendencies, um, in section two, I uh, take this and ask if instead of Donald Trump being on the, on the verge of triggering a constitutional crisis, has in fact already the constitutional crisis happened? And that a constitutional crisis happened um, silently or evidently, we accept maybe normalize it. A good place to mark it is perhaps at the beginning of the Cold War, the collapse of the uh, Eastern Bloc and the slow collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. Maybe it's uh, you know the, the, the triumph of the corrupt Clinton gang in uh, 1992. I mean, there's all kinds of ways of going about this, but it is in a sense um, a crisis constitution already existing. Not a written one, but one that's filmed, one that's coded, one that's recorded, one that's scripted, one that's televised, one that's mediated, one that's on our cell phones. Uh, one that we live in in a, a veritable info glut of 24 by 7 uh, multi-spectral debates in which this crisis constitution leads to Trump rather than Trump, in a sense, causing a constitutional crisis. And it could have been somebody else, you know, could have been Jesse Ventura, you know, could have been Mike Huckabee, uh, could have been Hillary Clinton, who knows. Uh, but we have Donald, and he is a nice limit case to expose many of these kinds of tendencies within the republic. Um, so in this, I, I go back a ways and think, well, you know, we could, we could run, wind the movie further back, maybe to as far as World, as world War I, uh, you know, the, the nature of the United States after World War II, where it, it, it clearly was the uncontested sole superpower of the world, uh, probably the high point of American power. Uh, 2,000 bases all over the world, doing extreme, uh, you know, pretty much uncontested, and then begins to feel threatened with the acquisition of atomic weapons by the Soviet Union, various wars of national liberation and whatnot. But nonetheless, uh, here we are, you know, in the 20 teens, the transition of the Obama administration to the Trump administration, and what we still have is a global empire of bases that for the most part is probably a standing provocation to cause continuing crises to fuel a parliamentary demo uh, democracy of crisis and the crisis constitution. Um, after all, we have you know about 800 bases worldwide and uh, they're in about 80 countries uh, more or less openly, maybe in about another seven to eight countries less openly. We have 11 mobile bases uh, in uh, carrier strike groups. Uh, each flight deck is almost five acres in extent. that can float around with supporting vessels and uh, also provide a certain kind of presence. Our bases uh, had shrunk from 1945 to 1991 down to 1600, but then um, they were only in about 40 countries. Since 1991, they've risen up to at least 80 countries. Some people say as many as 132 countries. And all of this is taking, as you might have read in the latest budget document, uh, a gleefully spent $700 billion a year. Uh, about a fifth of that probably goes to the sustaining of this empire of cases. So, um, the crisis constitution seems to be very much uh, caught up within uh, a strange uh, state of quasi-war and semi-peace, which in turn is uh, maintained at along the frontiers of this scattering of bases around the world in 80 countries. <laughs> in which uh, we are mostly paying for on credit cards. Um, in 1980, uh, the United States was only about $1 trillion in debt when Ronald Reagan came into office. Uh, right now, we're at uh, officially $21 trillion. That's not counting the other underfunded, uh, you know, kinds of uh, uh, obligations that we have, which are about 62, 65. And the new uh, Trump budget essentially says 
Uh, he's going to borrow a trillion dollars a year just to keep the, the uh, government going to sustain this, if you will, uh, parliamentary democracy of crisis. So uh, I spent a lot of time kind of digging into the weeds of this in terms of the crisis constitution. Ask what the constitution is all about. Uh, are we, in a sense, the same Democratic Republic of 1787? Or is there a kind of new, less liberal? And uh, I play around by illiberal. I mean, it might be illiberal as in Poland or Hungary, or it might be just liberal as in we're kind of sick liberal. Uh, and in doing that, uh, where are we going with our liberals? So it's an exploration of the spirit of democracy, the spirit of the republic, and the success of uh, markets in the United States since uh, 1989. And I you know, just start, start thinking about some of the practices that we're committed to in terms of maintaining the goals of the preamble of the uh, Constitution which uh, increasingly seem framed as much by technocracy and plutocracy, if you want to call it a crackocracy of the strong with the police, security, military organs, and uh, the commodification of elections. Obviously now the uh, ephemeral constitution of uh, opinionated publics by Russian bots on troll farms uh, scattered around uh, Russia and various other places playing the odds in information warfare to disrupt our, our so-called democracy and how it works. And uh, therefore, kind of conclude by asking, uh, is this crisis constitution uh, what is uh, more active in the actual guidance of the practices of governance that we actually see and observe every day, even though the 1787 Constitution is there as a kind of backstop, a connector maybe between the pieces to keep them from totally flying off into space. But there seems to be a tension here between uh, these kinds of two understandings of a fund fundamental order, which, I, as I say, I think is uh, brought to a nice crystallization with the uh, current president of the United States and his various goings on even though, despite all of his rantings about how there's a lot of illegitimate things going on and it's a hoax and whatnot, you know, the FBI has discovered that some of these things that people have been saying about the 2016 election are indeed happening, but they started in 2014 before he really got into the race, and he seems to be, right now at least, somewhat harmless, although they were unwittingly played, it is said, by these kinds of external uh, interventions within the continuation of this form of governance, which is here to provide for our common welfare, and uh, by which we all of them, as I say, uh, in its actual practice, in the crisis constitution, in the 24 by 7, on the discourse of that sovereignty. You want to read the paper up here. Thank you. I guess we're going to continue along that same line. Uh, thank you, Speaker Mark Weiner of Lucky uh, New York School of Law. He's going to speak on climate change denial as a historical consciousness of problems of a challenge to liberal constitutional theory. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, today, I'd like to offer a perspective on the philosophical structure of Trumpism as a political movement and also to reflect upon the challenge that it poses to liberal constitutional theory. Uh, as a liberal myself, my basic view is that we should respond to Trumpism's electoral success by regrounding. Uh, our constitutional project in a deeper appreciation for liberalism as a particular way of life and for the substantive cultural commitments underlying the liberal rule of law. Now, I'm, I'm led to this view by a reading of what I believe to be the central role played within Trumpism by various forms of historical consciousness. And that's going to be my central concern here. And I'll focus specifically on the idea that Trumpism's most significant form of historical consciousness is, in fact, climate change denial. 
and that is a popular philosophy of history, denialism forms this symbolic linchpin of Trumpian anti-liberal politics. So at a Tino's conference, it won't be controversial to say that at root those politics rest on a steadily growing crisis of political representation and legitimacy. According to a recent Democracy Fund study, the Trump voters divide into roughly five different types. About 30% are Christian value conservatives, and 25% are free market libertarians. These are groups whose loyalty to the GOP was to be expected, regardless of the candidate. 5% are what the study calls the disengaged. Uh, and then the remaining 40% divide about evenly into American nativists, who are poor, uneducated whites for whom immigration restriction as a policy is a priority. And then a general middle class group of uh, anti-elites, perhaps these are uh, Professor Sulkinen's um, middle class authoritarians, about whom we heard in the last session, who are more moderate on immigration and race issues than their native allies. But these last two groups tend to hold, interestingly, progressive economic values, and in the past many of them voted Democratic, but they've come to share the underlying beliefs that our political system is fundamentally rigged against them by the globalizing liberal Davos class, symbolized by Hillary Clinton, uh, and that normal politics undermine the public interest. In other words, they believe that the ideal of popular sovereignty that underwrites American constitutionalism has become a neoliberal sham. Like populist movements elsewhere in the world, and uh, Brexit certainly comes to mind, Trumpism promises to solve this crisis of representation, a crisis of both political practical accountability and political aesthetics, by restoring popular sovereignty to the forgotten, often through illiberal changes to the legal and constitutional order. Trumpism is still young, and its precise shape has yet to become apparent. But as with other political movements, I think we'll know that it's been fully realized ideologically once it achieves a robust historical consciousness. Just like uh, the individual self, political movements are animated by a sense of their past. That consciousness will include expressed views about key historical events, about how history moves and what its meaning is, and about Trumpism's own role as a political agent within the flux of time. Uh, the American founders, uh, they possessed such historical awareness when they drafted the Constitution and Bill of Rights to protect ancient English liberties, defined and identified by 17th century common law jurists like uh, Lord Cook. Uh, a different form of historical consciousness, Dana, signaled the maturity of Marxism in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte with its discussion of the role of class conflict and the proletarian, a proletariat and historical change. And among anti-liberal movements today, especially in Europe, one can find many parallel examples of political thinkers engaged with the philosophy of history, uh, such as Bill and I we talked about this last night, such as uh, Alexander Dugin's The Fourth Political Theory, which rests on an extended argument that historical time can run backward, uh, or in a very different vein, Alain de uh, Bonnois and the French New Right's interest in conceptions of time drawn from European antiquities. Now, if, if Trumpism represents something new, a Trumpian form of historical thinking eventually will coalesce as part of the natural course of its political praxis, if only because the movement's leaders and adherents will need to justify the president's actions over the next three to seven years. And its foundation, I think, is already in place. Throughout its existence, Trumpism has incorporated many forms of historical thinking, variously supporting each other and competing for dominance. History as heritage and nostalgia make America great again, the, the core uh, electoral slogan of, the Trump, of Trumpism was, was elegiac. History as reverence and fidelity, the Straussianism of the Claremont Review, and the constitutional originalism of the Federalist Society. History as a philosophy of action, 
embodied in the popular and really surprisingly gripping novels of Newt Gingrich, uh, Trump's intellectual precursor. Uh, really, what to read? History as Racial Melancholy, Charlottesville. Uh, history as a resource for trans historical Germanic mythology, the masculinist branches of the alt right. Uh, history as Conspiracy, Infowars, hashtag fake news. And then, most systematically, Stephen Bannon's philosophy of generational change, which is a kind of toxic blend of Toynbee and Jung. Uh, it's inspired by the recent popular sociological novel, The Fourth Turning. Bannon <coughs> argued that Trump was the instrument of an eternal recurring cycle of apocalypse and renewal. In my view, though, the most important form of historical consciousness under Trumpism has been climate change denial with which the president has strongly associated himself. For instance, describing the idea that human behavior has exacerbated climate change as a hoax invented by the Chinese to undermine our way of life. Now, we, we naturally tend to understand climate change denial as part of a larger struggle over the respect accorded scientific data in the making of public policy, and it is that. But stripped of its meteorological content and considered formally, Climate change denial also is a claim about the meaning of events as they unfold over time. It's a view about the history of the environment. And as a framework for interpreting the past, it structurally supports the core metaphysical commitments of Trumpian populist <coughs> nationalism in its confrontation with cosmopolitan individualist liberals. And to, to understand why, I think it's helpful to bear in mind some basic lessons about political community articulated by Carl Schmitt. Most important in Schmitt's view, and I hope I'm putting this in a way that people with varying perspectives on Schmitt can agree. I will be thinking with him, not through him, as uh, Paul Kahn might say. Uh, a uh, political community comes into being when its members recognize some aspect of their common existence and hold it to be worth defending with their lives. This cultural and ethical self-recognition of a shared nomos provides the basis for the friend and enemy distinction at the core of the political uh, um, as a domain of human value. I think of your discussion of the people's choice under heaven. It constitutes the foundation of sovereignty and of a state that can legitimately require individuals to sacrifice in its name, and it forms the philosophical precondition of all itself. From this insight follow at least two corollaries, both of which I think have been regularly violated uh, by the post-war end of the order. Uh, first, uh, for Schmidt, a community's ability to draw the friend-enemy distinction can brook no conceptual or institutional restraint. Most notably, the distinction can't be predicated on other domains of human value, such as morals, aesthetics, or economics, or on the decision of third-party institutions guided by them. When liberals base or limit the friend-enemy distinction on, on ideals drawn from other value domains, for instance, the universalist concept of human dignity in the German basic law, they depoliticize the polity and undermine the state by confusing the community's self-understanding. Second, in Schmidt's view, the state as the bearer of a people's sovereignty uh, needs to create clear territorial boundaries that correspond to its friend and enemy distinction. If the territory of the state doesn't track um, its distinction between friend and enemy, then the identity of its underlying political community also becomes muddled. And that process mirrors spatially the confusion that results when liberals seek to circumscribe sovereignty conceptually. Now, Trumpism, I think, broadly accords with Schmidt's understanding of the political and its critique of liberalism, both in its policy substance on free trade, the United Nations, respect for normative pluralism and foreign policy nation building, immigrant rights, the border wall, no more can be described as a wall, and also in its aesthetic style. Now that, that's not to say that Trump is a Schmidian, uh, to the extent that he is, it's in a highly parodic form, uh, but Schmidt provides a framework uh, for appreciating his appeal. I, I'd be happy to discuss more specific examples during the break, but most generally, Trump's repeated <laughs> pugilistic promise that I will never ever let you down uh, encapsulates his underlying view that liberals from both parties long ago lost sight of the American political community. 
that is, that the political in the United States has been circumscribed by people, institutions, and interests outside of sovereign control. Uh, and Trump's embrace of climate change denial is of a symbolic piece with that thoroughgoing critique. That's because contemporary climate science points toward a conception of the political that transcends particularistic cultural identity markers and encompasses uh, humanity as a whole. The community it imagines finds its political enemy not in rival sovereigns, but rather in a global climatic process that is simultaneously affecting the historical course of all nations together. This enemy, indeed, uh, is destabilizing the territorial boundaries of the world through rising sea levels, altering the very land from which the nomos of a people originally grows. It's undermining the spatial boundaries that Schmidt deems uh, essential to sovereignty by putting the export of negative externalities at the center of global concern. And it seems to call for placing sovereign nations under the control of third parties. In other words, it served as a powerful force of depolitization uh, with the potential to accomplish physically what liberals have long sought to accomplish at the level of theory. Now, by, by contrast, in dismissing the existence of a global climatic threat as the imaginary specter of liberal elites and interpreting the course of environmental history as the result of forces outside human control, that is, viewing extreme weather patterns as the result of a natural cycle in which humans can't intervene or as the result of God's will, Climate change deniers uh, for nationalism, popular sovereignty, and the culture and value commitments on which they're based. Uh, in this regard, it's worth noting that although climate change deniers and ethno-nationalists are in fact two separate demographic groups, uh, according to the Democracy Fund, ethno-nationalists surprisingly acknowledge the existence of human-induced climate change. Uh, their views about matters of popular sovereignty and political community overlap offering a common rhetorical ground for Trump's electoral coalition. All of which is to say that the environmental historical consciousness of climate change denial fosters a political consciousness uh, that addresses the growing crisis of representation in liberal societies. It's a form of historicity congruent with American populist constitutional politics. And that leads me to conclude uh, that to the extent that the structure of this consciousness provides a window onto the reason for Trump's success, liberals should turn centrally to the relation between culture and sovereignty as we theorize the polity and its underlying constitutional arrangements and as we make the constitutional <coughs> in everyday life palpable, to refer uh, to the words of Professor Schmidt last night, or Professor Schlegel. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Uh, sovereignty and culture should be uh, our watchwords, just like the engagement with phenomenology from the foundation of the intellectual descent of groups like Charter 77 and their struggle for an open society. Can we conceive of a politicized liberalism that involves a self conscious commitment to a rule of law with a strong, substantive, particularistic cultural foundation? A liberalism that addresses head on the dynamics of political identity that Schmidt identifies. And can we develop a contemporary liberal aesthetics on which to ground our advocacy for the practical reform of our constitutions in ways that vindicate popular sovereignty through new structures of political accountability? I hope so, because I believe that the liberal tradition, despite everything that's happened over the past 10, 20 years, does remain the best most effective vehicle for achieving common aspirations of human liberation. And a robustly political liberalism could continue to intervene in history and to enter. This panel is developing its own thematic coherence. <laughs> now, David Pan of the University of California, Irvine, is going to speak on state movement people, without comment, uh, contemporary antinomy of political identity. So, so I'd like to thank uh, Gerhard Schlink and uh, Helen Mina and other members of the workshop at UC Irvine uh, that took place
place at the beginning of this week um, for uh, their help in, uh, in my development of my own ideas uh, for today's talk. Uh, it was very helpful. Um, so uh, let me just get right into it here. Um, at the beginning of Carl Schmitt's constitutional theory, he lays out an understanding of a constitution in which it does not consist of a set of laws that would form a unified system of norms that govern state procedures. Rather, he insists that a state does not simply have a constitution, but is the constitution, in the sense that the constitution consists not just of the laws, but of, of quote, the concrete way of being of an existing political unity, end quote. Since the existence of political unity is the major achievement, any situation of such, of such unity implies a corresponding constitution, and the task of a constitutional theory is to determine the characteristics of such unity, independent of the existence of any set of norms that define the way that the laws should work. In this sense, any people can be characterized as uh, that can, any people that can, be char that can be characterized as such and is not simply an unorganized mass has an existing way of life and an implicit constitution that distinguishes it from another people. Every people has some kind of order not to be equated with explicit laws according to which one can distinguish this people from other peoples. Yet this implicit order of the people cannot be wholly implicit in order for the people to understand itself as a unity. Schmidt therefore recognizes that part of the way in which a people distinguishes itself from another people is the particular form of hierarchical, hierarchical order according to which it is organized. Quote, because there can be in social reality no order without superordination and subordination. End quote. Though it is not immediately apparent from this passage, the argument ultimately, ultimately becomes uh, a representational one in constitutional theory. The state form, whether for instance monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy, is not just a matter of the laws, but of the existing structures, formal and informal, that define the state structure and its procedures. This state form is a representational structure because it, it, because it involves the way in which the people sees itself as a unity. By seeing a representation of itself in the monarch, or in an aristocracy, or in the particular structures, such as parliaments, or town, town councils, or town meetings, that characterize its democracy, the people becomes a unity through the mediation of the state structure. Even if the people has a history, uh, traditions, and relationships that are the raw material, raw material for defining it as a people, this definition cannot occur in the concrete case without a representational structure that brings all these things together into a unity. Without the representation, the people will not be able to see itself as a political unity, and the state form is the particular representational mechanism for establishing this unity out, out of the multiple and conflicting stories, opinions, customs, relationships, and goals that exist in the people. Because it depends on representation, the unity of the people will always require a particular interpretation of what it is included and excluded in the concept of the people. A key aspect of the state form is the way in which it must marginalize alternative interpretations of legitimate order in order to define uh, its political unity. This interpretive character of the establishment of the state form in the representation <laughs> means that there is an inherent instability of the state form in the face of, in the face of shifts in representation. <coughs> this process of transformation in state form creates for Schmidt the third concept of the Constitution as a principle of dynamic becoming, in which, quote, political unity must be formed daily out of opposing interests, opinions, and aspirations, end quote. This, abs this, this third, third aspect of the Constitution is an acknowledgment of the circumstance that a people as a concrete existence cannot be thought of as static, but in a constant process of change, and that their changing states of mind must also be recognized by a constitutional theory. These three aspects of a political unity for Schmidt, the concrete existence of a people, the representation of the people in a, hier in a hierarchical ordering of relationships, and the ways in which this representation changes, become the key aspects of a constitutional theory that seeks to understand the constitution as a description of an existing political unity in a particular time and place rather than a set of abstract laws. If a constitution is only understood as the laws, then these laws would provide a rigid structure that would prevent any deviation of the state from the legal framework. Such an understanding that does not include an analysis of the representational form would not be able to explain the way that states change over time. 
Schmidt's theory of constitutional reform consequently depends upon a theory of representation, which is the mechanism by which the people sees itself as a people and which, and which explains how this self-conception, by changing over time, also transforms the laws. If Schmidt has a fairly abstract account of this representational process in his 1928 constitutional theory, the rise of the Nazis gives Schmidt the opportunity in his 1933 state movement people, the tripartite structure of political unity, to explain a concrete instance of the kind of representational transformation that he has in mind. Unfortunately, this essay, while it fills in the lacuna of his constitutional theory, only does so in a way that fails to take into account uh, to, uh, the, the representational character of political transformation, replacing representations with a static structure. Uh, <clears throat> we can proceed to show how it does it. The strength of the 1933 essay is that it does not simply explain the Nazi takeover take over of power as an instance of how the laws of the Weimar Republic lost their legitimacy and effect. Such an explanation would lead to the idea that the Nazi takeover could only have been prevented by more effectively enforcing the power and legitimacy of the laws of the Weimar Republic. But such an explanation simply begs the question of how and why the laws could have been so easily <coughs> dissolved. Instead of insisting on the priority of laws for understanding the Constitution, Schmidt delves into the reasons for how the laws could be so easily set aside, and he interprets the key moment of the Enabling Act of March 24, 1933, as the point at which a political movement was able to abrogate the Weimar Constitution and replace it with a new understanding of political identity based on the unity of the German people and on the Führer as the representation of this unity. If the Enabling Act was lawfully passed as a constitutional amendment to the Weimar Constitution, which it was, its transformative character as an amendment was to reimagine the identity of the current people so that it no longer saw itself as represented by the Reichstag, but by Adolf Hitler, who was granted the authority to enact laws. If liberal theory would, would reject such a transformative amendment to the Constitution, it could not do so based on the sacredness of the laws themselves, but on the basis of a particular understanding of how the people are to be represented solely by an elected parliament, who then would have the power to pass laws. Any other origination of laws, such as through the pronouncements of a, a clerical elite, or in this case, through the declarations of a single dictator, would be considered illegitimate. But in this case, such legit, legitimate, le, legitimacy <laughs> would be based not on the illegality of a dictatorial system, as the Enabling Act was passed according to the requirements of the Weimar Constitution, but because the state form that the amendment established was not in accord with a liberal understanding of what type of state form is legitimate. But for Schmidt, the question of which state form is legitimate is not ultimately a legal question that can be decided by jurists or philosophers, but a political question that can only be determined through the will of the people. If the elected parliament loses the legitimacy of the people and they instruct the parliament to transfer its legislative power to a single person, this is not a case of a failure of the law, but of a change in the people's self-understanding of the representational form of its own unity. This change comes about for Schmidt through the people's decision that the Weimar system of parliamentary elections as the basis for government had been undermined by its lack of political unity. The key problem for Schmidt of the Weimar system was that the different parties were not simply offering different policy proposals, but competing conceptions of the very basis for political order. In such a situation, a decision eventually had to be made to establish one of these options, communist, fascist, liberals, uh, to be the framework for the future state form. The implication is that without such, such a decision, there would have been a breakdown of order, a disintegration of sovereignty, and a consequent dissolution into civil war. The consequence of a decision to transform the state into a mechanism of the Nazi party, though, was that the alternative conceptions of order offered by the other parties would have to be outlawed by the, outlawed by the new state, leading to the declaration of their enemy status, and Schmidt declares, on the one hand, the Weimar Constitution to have been dissolved by the Enabling Act, and on the other hand, the Communist Party to be the official enemy of the people. While Schmidt effectively explains the political basis of the shift to a national socialist government as a transformation of the form of the German state, his subsequent analysis of the structure of the, Germans, of, of the Nazi state runs into difficulty. If constitutional theory emphasizes how the state form is based on a representation of the unity of the people and the dynamic aspect of the constitution as a result of the changes that, is, that this self-representation undergoes over time, 
state movement people adjusts this conception by theorizing that the Nazi state establishes a tripartite structure of political unity. Within this structure, Schmidt understands the state to be limited to, quote, the state officials and administrative entities consisting of the army and the state civil servants, end quote. In limiting this to the state to its bureaucratic officials, Schmidt retains the state as a mechanism of command. Taking over the idea of the state as a neutral apparatus that carries out laws, Schmidt recognizes, however, that this neutral status can only be maintained with the understanding that the, that the bureaucratic me mechanism will always, in fact, be subordinate to some politically established understanding of order. If his criticism of the liberal state system is that a set of laws are never, in fact, neutral but politically motivated, his conception of the Nazi state recognizes this political character of all order by separating out the explicitly political aspect of the state, which he describes as, quote, as, quote a party underlying state of people recruited from all strata of the people, but self-contained and led hierarchically because it requires a particularly rigid structure and a firm leadership in whose political body the movement finds its specific form, end quote. By separating out the political aspect of the state from its bureaucratic aspect and locating it within the Nazi party, Schmidt is able to understand the state not as a neutral entity for carrying out the laws, but as having a specific political orientation that, that, that determines the status of the laws and their specific form. To the extent that he thereby recognizes the, recognizes the way in which a state always has a political aspect that can be most clearly recognized through the party affiliation of the leaders of government, Schmidt indeed undermines the understanding of the state as a neutral form that only carries out laws. Yet his equation of the party with the movement creates a problematic freezing of the dynamic character of the movement into the structures of a specific party. If his, con if his constitutional theory referred to the dynamic character of the constitution as something that relates to the changing character of a people, his merging of movement with party has the effect of stabilizing the transformative character of movements into one specific understanding of the political that now becomes defining for the state. In equating with the party with in equating the party with all movement and thus with the diamond with the dynamic aspect of political development as such, Schmidt denies that the people is in fact a developing unity. The difficulty of Schmidt's account in state movement people is that he is that he does not acknowledge the representational character of this dynamic process. We see this lack of a sense for the representational character of order in his characterization of the people as, quote, a sphere of the people left to self-administration, incorporating both the professional economic and social order as well as communal self-administration, end quote. Rather than referring to the people as the place of opinions and aspirations, as in constitutional theory, here it becomes the sphere of local government and administration, understood here uh, as a neutral sphere that could not develop any independent political direction that, not does, that does not come to, from the party in power. Though Schmidt integrates a political aspect into, into the structure of the state, he does so in a way that denies the way in which politics develops as an evolution of attitudes amongst the people that would eventually influence state structure. Even if he sees this process at work in the move from the Weimar Constitution to the structure of the Nazi state, his subsequent affirmation of the structure of the state as a merging of state movement and people into a harmonious whole misses the way in which the substance of politics consists of transformations of representations. The alternative approach suggested by constitutional theory would leave the moment as an expression of popular will that arises an, as an outgrowth of dissatisfaction by a part of the people with some aspect of, of existing institutions. The power of movements arises precisely from the way that they take hold of people, providing them with a sense of purpose in their recognition of the way in which the movement raises concerns that are not currently addressed by existing structures. Encompassing examples from the Protestant Revolution in Europe to abolitionism and the Tea Party movement in the US, these examples of dynamic forces amongst the people are always characterized by a dissatisfaction with existing legal and institutional structures. Yet these movements then disappear as movements to the extent that their concerns become recognized and established into new legal structures and institutions. When Schmidt and the Nazi equate the movement with the party, they become totalitarian by preventing any further dynamic aspect of politics 
that could come from future movements that might arise in opposition to existing party structures. Schmidt does not allow for any new movements to oppose Nazi party structures in the same way that in the US, for instance, the Tea Party movement can be clearly distinguished from the Republican Party. Once we ascertain the role of movements as the basis for political change, we can begin to think through the way in which US democracy presents a liberal democracy that avoids Schmidt's difficulties by maintaining possibilities of different movements for transforming state and legal structures. In this process, movements arise out of the people but inevitably need to take on a representation of form that then, be, that then becomes the basis for new structures of state form. The relationships cannot be understood as a tripartite structure of state movement and people, but rather as a set of antinomies in which the people are subordinated to the state form and that a people needs a representational form in order to constitute itself as a people, but in which the state also depends on the recognition of the people to maintain its legitimacy. Within this structure, movements are the source of transformations that break up an existing representational form. Final papers for Russell Berman of Stanford University. We'll continue this theme here. Uh, Schmidt, the crises of parliamentary democracy. Russell, crises. Well, actually, I changed the title to Our Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy. Our one. And our. But first, I want to add a, uh, to express a word of thanks. So we had a little a health incident up there in Mark, who was a real hero in his EIT expertise. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to make some comments about uh, recent politics uh, in North America. And um, uh, in general, I think we're way too distracted by idiosync idiosyncrasies of personality when we look at, at, um, at policy in Western Europe as well. Uh, and we should really pay attention to what's really happening rather than what's being said. Um, and uh, I think we here, um, this is a bit partisan, uh, with some affection for liberal democracy, are way too self-confident about the viability of our model. Uh, it's much weaker than, uh, than we think, both domestically and internationally. In that sense, I don't share David's optimism about uh, American liberal democracy. Uh, um, I mean, I'll, I'll skip an introduction where I reflect a little bit on this rhetoric of uh, Trump as Hitler, uh, which you're all familiar with from the campaign and afterwards, which is proven massively hyperbolic, really minimization of what Hitler was about, and a, and a, and a sort of programmatic misunderstanding of Trump. Um, the uh, institutions of American democracy uh, have proven much more robust. Uh, uh, we're not uh, in the middle of a dictatorship, as, despite what's been imagined. Nonetheless, and here I start, the instability in American democracy, the, 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 the hypothesis of an instability in American democracy shouldn't be dismissed out of hand even if the uh, uh, attacks on Trump have proven uh, insubstantial. It's worth considering whether the Schmidtian description of imminent tensions within liberal democracy is useful to understand the character of current American politics. The core thesis from the 1923 account asserts a profound incompatibility between a culture of liberalism indebted to a structure of public debate and democracy as the expression of a pop popular subject not reducible to a quantitative majority. So these two principles also involve a stratification between the political culture of an elite and the habits of a wider citizenry. That binary between uh, characterized by, a, by uh, a, an elite liberalism, characterized by linguistic advantage, elaborate speech codes constitutive of public debate, of parliamentary debate, and on the other hand, features of a mass populist public might well establish a bridge between Schmidt's account and our present moment, even though that hypothesis is at best suggestive and very broad brush. Although I can't resist saying this is, I can't think of a better objectification of this than the distinction between the brevity of tweets 
in Nancy Pelosi's famous eight-hour speech. <laughs> if there's any indication of the um, of the um, arthritic character of, of liberalism, it's that. Uh, um, in the in the rhetorical competition between long form and short form, short form is going to win, uh, uh, and and short form is arguably the more democratic. Way. A more promising road, however, involves taking Schmidt as just as a prompt, but not a definitive roadmap to inquire into the character of contemporary American political life. The Republic institutions have been able to withstand significant challenges, yet, my thesis, there are indeed threats to our constitutional order, if even if they are not coming from, or if you prefer, exclusively from the White House. Some aspects of the situation do echo Schmidtian arguments, um, but others are reflective of today's very different political culture. So it's not 1923 or 1933, but there are some insights here that are relevant, I think, and that's the way to, to reach men. So a few, um, a series of points. First, the, the disappearance of parliamentary debate. This is perhaps the most Schmidtian uh, point. Parliamentary culture, which was once distinguished by debate, and the development of political agenda in a public sphere has given way to a system in which key legislative choices are being made regularly behind closed doors. The pattern is bipartisan. Both the Affordable Care Act and the Trump tax reforms were hammered out in detail in, in, detail in private, and subsequent political deba public debate was exclusively perfunctory. Public statements only serve competitive purposes, talking points, rather than anything like a genuine pursuit of inquiry, and certainly not common ground. The gradual process by which the Senate gives up its admittedly arcane rules concerning supermajorities reflects this tendency. Moreover, partisan agenda points appear to serve the purpose only of mobilizing the respective bases for votes and for fundraising. Instead of developing legislation to solve per problems, the parties are strategizing for the next election. At stake is the care and freedom, feeding of the political class, not the well-being of the electorate. Secondly, the unilateralism as which the foreign policy of George W. Bush uh, administration was attacked, and the attendant theory of a unitary executive have now become a bipartisan second nature. So I guess my theme is, we're, you know, we're taught to think of Obama and uh, Trump as, as antipodes, but there are, in fact, profound continuities and undemocratic or illiberal continuities across the regimes. In fact, I'm even using the word regime. <laughs> uh, the, predominance, the predominance of executive orders reached an apogee in the Obama administration with its endemic faith in rule by government and bureaucracy. The Trump administration, maybe to its credit, appears to be ratcheting that back but apprehension remains legitimately that it too is inclined to rule by fiat. There is furthermore a risk of confusing the question of the presidential personality, the persona of Obama who was different from Trump, with the broader empowerment of the executive and continuity <coughs> over administrations. It is one thing to contrast the Trumpian bluster with Obama's cool, but it's quite a different matter to politicize the IRS as a vehicle to attack political opponents let alone the politicization of the FBI that has evidently, evidently returned to the habits of J. Edgar Hoover. Again, commentary. Yeah, this is the same FBI that couldn't follow up on that, uh, that tip about the high school shooter has lots of time to engage in political, um, political machinations. Analytic, we should really be worried about political, uh, political politicized uh, secret police. Analytically, one should parse the difference between a natural inertia <laughs> bureaucratic structure on the one hand, and a partisan, implicitly conservative and anti-democratic resistance to a controversial administration on the other. I mean, that would be the real con con um, comparison to the Weimar Republic where you had a, a, um, a, um, a bureaucracy inherited from the empire that was resisting democratization. This may be less a Schmidtian action than a Weberian moment in which the viability of democracy depends on a charismatic legitimacy of the president as a corrective to government structures inherently marked by a democracy deficit. Third, the Sixth Amendment guarantees, get the Sixth Amendment guarantee of a speedy jury trial has an anachronistic rate to it. Access to high quality counsel is becoming prohibitively expensive for most. The expansion of federal law has effectively abrogated the prohibition against double jeopardy. 
and the practice of plea bargaining has ended protection against self-incrimination. Meanwhile, in upper echelons, the courts have been repeatedly used as a vehicle to attack political opponents, directly, as with Alaska Senator Stevens, and indirectly with Scooter Libby as a standard for Dick Cheney. Yet even larger, so that's the context in which one should talk about those, those ridiculous calls to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, prosecute Hillary Clinton. This has become part and parcel of our political imagination. Yet even larger threats to the credibility of the judi judiciary results from its own activism, its predisposition to rule on controversial issues that by right belong to the political process, such as abortion and marriage. By overreaching, the judiciary has taken on a political profile which undermines its claim to independence. What is worth noting, however, is that the courts have also largely stood up against the tweet attacks by President Trump, in contrast, for example, with the Supreme Court's caving when it was famously attacked by President Obama during his 2010 State of the Union address and otherwise. The threat to an independent judiciary as a component of liberal democracy is under attack from both administrations. Fourth. The culture at large shows a growing attraction to the appeals of anti-elitism, which is ultimately anti-liberalism. This anti-elitism was present, obviously, on the left in the Occupy Wall Street movement and the attacks on the 1%. But the Tea Party and then the Populist Register of Trump's campaign also staked out a version of anti-elitism elitism from the right. Although, to be sure, anti-elitism is not an obviously conservative position by any means. Anti, that is, I think there's maybe a stronger conservative critique of populism than there's a liberal critique of populism. Anti-elitism, on the contrary, tends to erase the right-left distinction migrating across the political spectrum. Just as in Europe, we see populism from the left in Syriza and Podemos, and from the right in National Front and the Hot Day in Germany. Some of this rhetoric, some of this anti-elitist uh, rhetoric in the United States may simply represent a recycled amplification of standard capital D Democratic Party class trouble rhetoric. For example, its attack on the wealth of candidate Romney in 2012. So when we listen to the Democratic Party on Trump, we should remember that Romney was already the Antichrist, so it's really hard to, uh, hard to, trump, hard, hard to trump that. <laughs> <laughs> Yet more now is at stake, a sense of rage against the vaguely invoked privileged classes pointedly phrased in Trump's inaugural and uh, Jacksonian celebration of the common people. The small d democratic multitude takes shape against a new class of liberal elite in a way that seems to corroborate the Schmidtian thesis of the oxymoron character of liberal democracy. So the left critique of neoliberalism has just now been taken up by the right. Nor can we overlook, and we talk about the self demolition of the elite, nor can we overlook the spectacle of this past year, the revolution, revelations concerning sexual abuse, which has been nothing if not a never-ending scandal of delegitimization, delegitimation of the privileged elite across party lines and across cultural sectors, in entertainment, in news, in the academy, in politics. These cases show the elite, elite men squandering the credibility of their privilege. And this is this is the scandal of the last days of the Ancien Regime in France. <laughs> it's the only way to think. You have all, all these representatives of, uh, of accomplishment and privilege and power just misbehaving. And, uh, it, and, and one, sh one shouldn't be surprised if there's a popular outrage against this, and this turns into anti-elitism. And one should not be surprised if that ends up with this deeply illiberal character. Fifth. The ability to transmit and develop a narrative of national cohesion has been significantly weakened by the character of the institutionalized humanities in higher education. The notion of a cohesive community has been supplanted by a mandate for an ever-expanding diversity, while the experience of the national or more broadly Western past is treated only in terms of joyless denunciation. The past is disappearing from common knowledge, at least in the education sector. So-called critical thinking, turns out too often just to be obligatory cynicism toward any achievement or legacy, which therefore loses all claims to our loyalty, all claims on our loyalty. Schmidt's argument for the homogeneity in democracy could be rephrased today as the question of the dubious viability of democracy, given dubious viability, not desirability, but dubious viability of democracy, 
given the absence of shared values, shared history, or shared identity. The dominant paradigm of political correctness and anti-imperialism amounts to a programmatic distancing from any positive understanding of the American project. One result of this version of anti-elitism has been the blocked reproduction of any foreign policy elite no longer emerging from top universities, with self-evident results in the foreign policy of several administrations. Sixth, and finally, we need to take note of a cogent criticism of liberal democracy that has emerged not from the nationalist far-right fringes, but instead in the very heart of the technologically most advanced sector, Silicon Valley. In a heady mixture of California libertarianism, Austrian economics, and late youth culture anarchism, a critique of the managerial state has combined the techno-utopianism and the neo-elitism of the engineering class. Would governance, after all, not take place more effectively if it were carried out by those more equipped with intelligence and un unencumbered by the largely ritualistic periodic elections whose corruption by money is now established fact across the political spectrum? We should not underestimate the scope of the concentration of information and technological ability and power and its potential to deploy that concentration politically. Put polemically, does the danger to democracy come less from Steve Bannon and his work, his ilk, than from Apple and Facebook? Curtis Yarvin and Nick Land have drawn the theoretical consequences, and Peter Thiel is the conduit to the circus of political power. Conclusion. Subversion of democratic substance in the three branches of government, compounded by an extensive illiberal anti-elitism, a lack of national cohesion, and the emergence of sophisticated critique of democracy. So what? One might hope to chalk this up to American politics as usual or American politics in the extreme. Today's political polarization has been compared to the conflicts between the Federalists and Jefferson and the early Republic, or even the moment of the Civil War. Yet such comparisons to the Civil War are hardly consoling because of our global setting. Our simmering crisis of liberal democracy domestically has to be framed by the grand challenge the United States is fa facing internationally by China. The issue is not only the military, strategic, and economic competitions, which can be understood in fairly standard terms. The issue is whether the American system of government, as it now exists, and not as we wish it might be, represents a sufficiently effective alternative to Chinese government style. China represents the wager that economic growth can succeed without democracy and nonetheless satisfy its populace. Looking at Washington, the Chinese wager may begin to seem plausible. We face the question as to whether the character of American democracy remains sufficiently robust to provide a credible alternative as a model both for skeptics around the world, but also as a model for democracy skeptics within the United States. Thank you. We have a shortened time for discussion, so I'd like to, to forego the discussion among the uh, panelists and go directly to questions. And I'm also going to honor my role as a, as a neutral moderator rather than engaging an eight hour discussion with them on Carl Schmidt. <laughs> so, so. Thank you. Uh, so I have two questions one for Professor Berman and uh, one for Professor Dog. I'm going to start with Professor Berman because it's very hard to avoid that. Uh, when we are engaged in deficit spending and we pretty much owe our lifestyle to China, it's very hard to say China is doing badly. But that, against that, I'm going to say um, I was a bit um, miffed by the equation of, um, of the administration, Obama's administration, with the Trump's administration. So maybe because English is not my first language, maybe that's the problem. So I ju I'm just going to say that uh, there is a, a lot to say that they are, uh, they are different. For example, I'm going to the Supreme Court nominee that uh, Obama had, and uh, in a very uh, undemocratic way, um, the Senate um, just ignored. Never. 
that never happened in this country before. Then uh, uh, Trump uh, went there uh, and uh, had his own nominee for the U.S. Supreme uh, uh, Court, and uh, that was also never heard of. Uh, and these are liberal uh, examples that uh, we're in the midst of a huge liberal crisis, democratic crisis. And uh, uh, more on that, um, the legislative body uh, passed um, um, sanctions against Russia. The president refuses to sign on them. Never heard of in this country. Totally illegal, totally um, under democratic. Um, also, a refusal to accept uh, realities um, proved by the FBI that there is um, uh, a Russian influence, uh, influence in our uh, electoral um, results. Um, and how can we engage with something that doesn't exist? If we deny reality, we can't really engage in criticism. So I would like to know we, uh, how that, keep this? yes, how that uh, um, it makes the previous administration uh, similar to the current administration. And for, for Professor Luke, uh, on okay. a different term, because could I think Jay. Could we hold off and help you do have limited Just, time. just so fast. I just want to question. remind you <laughs> I really enjoyed your earlier work where you were talking about uh, the playfulness of information. Mm -hmm. And today you are talking about the crash, the crash of, of the cultures. And uh, I cannot forget your reading when I was a PhD student about the nodal points mm -hmm. of um, every, uh, the real time, the nodal points. Mm -hmm. And today you seem to be in a different <laughs> position. So maybe I'm just kidding. I can't respond to all of this. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting myself saying that. Reading the press any day, we can hear about the differences between the two. I think critical thinking compels us to also look at the continuities between the two. In terms of foreign policy, neither has been pursuing a uh, neoconservative, aggressive internationalism. Both have been engaged in forms of gradual withdrawalism, I think, maybe for different reasons. So in terms of international policy, there's a lot of continuity. I believe, secondly, that there's continuity in terms of accrual of power to the executive authority. Both have engaged in attacks on the independent judiciary. Different tonalities, different registers, obviously different personalities, but we should look at structural continuities. Oh, oh sorry, Tim, you would like to respond? Um, yeah, quickly respond. Um, I think. Looking at, uh, you're talking about nationality versus nodality, those kinds of articulations of space. Yeah, I, I'm, I am interested in not getting caught up in so called territorial traps, which are related to classic geopolitical boundaries. I'm looking instead at uh, the space of flows, wherein, for example, there, there is a big contradiction in the sense that people see a geopolitical face-off, uh, contradiction, naval race, arms race, et cetera, between the PRC and the USA. But then by the same token, they all, we are in many ways uh, coexisting Pacific economy. That uh, the Chinese economy in many ways cannot operate in the way it does without the USA, the USA in many ways without the PRC. And that uh, what opaqueness, I would say, about both American capitalism and I mean, Chinese uh, centrally planned state capitalism is disturbing in different ways and probably closer to crisis than everybody admits. And I think that that's where I would trace out these sort of more um, techno uh, informatic um, monetary flows. We're going to actually extend the period to 3 o'clock, so I don't have to act like an intolerant illiberal There was a specter called China hollering around. Yes, in the morning session. All those only there's a location is called China House. It's also penetrated the Deutsches House. So there was one way. From a sort of a imagined historical distance, the difference, the difference of the value system or the uh, uh, sort of different uh, form of forms government, uh, I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate just for the, for the sake of the argument. Could that be 
argued as a sort of cultural difference. Namely, just for, for a moment, using this for an Hegelian prism, America, the model, democracy or liberalism, you call it, but from a from the Hegelian Chinese perspective, it's just one out of many. This is harmony out of disharmony. You, you fight things out, I mean, fight things through eventually what you are, I mean, defines who you are, right? The processes will, these are the fine creeps, whereas we get things done in a different fashion. Uh, like, it's also probably could be argued in the Hegelian English medium terms, it's sort of like uh, internalization of external order or something, you know, civil, so, so, uh, this sort of uh, civil obedience, uh, this goes on and on. I was wondering whether, uh, to what extent you consider it still necessary or productive to continue to see it in terms of uh, uh, in terms of, uh, if I may, I'm not talking about, uh, uh, it's not a criticism, it's just a, in terms of uh, something that eventually would arrive at, say, political theology, good and evil, you know, that's universally valid, that is obviously absolutely wrong. Uh, just listening to stories from both sides, it seems the, the, the political theological uh, narrative or, or, or argument seems to be less and less persuasive. I don't want to call the, the alternative a cultural approach. Uh, it's far less critical than, you know, uh, or, or, or make us comfortable. But nevertheless, call it historical, call it you know, empirical, whatever, pragmatic. Is there an you know, alternative to, to this yeah, American democracy versus like, uh, something undemocratic? So <clears throat> you said that you get things done in your way, suggesting here that we might perceive that as somehow authoritarian or government driven. Uh, you may get things done, you and China may get things done in your way. We're very successful at not getting things done. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the crisis that, that we face right now, in that when we, we, in this academic gathering in New York City, so we you know, incline to be, have an affectionate relationship toward notions of liberal democracy, worry about whatever we project onto Trump, or whatever we project onto China, or sideshow Russia, uh, I think we should be self-critically uh, uh, reflective on the character of the liberal democracy that we propound, because it is in many ways, it remains, it, it, it's demonstrating lack of effectiveness, and lack of credibility, and lack of le legitimacy. And we can, we, can, we can chalk this up to Russian agents hiding under our beds, you know, a kind of bizarre rebirth of McCarthyist uh, era paranoia. The point is that something isn't working, and it has to do with with, with structures and power, and you're, 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 you're right, ultimately, with values, with, with culture. Now, I think there is, there, now methodologically, and this is where it gets boring, I think there are, there are problems with cultural analyses. We, they tend to homogenize too much. If, we'd have, if we were to have an account of American culture, it would have to be robust enough to include both Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi, right? But if it, if, if it includes them both, then that's a way to talk about their difference as well. And I can only imagine there's a similar range in, in China. Uh, uh, one suggestion in my talk is that there's a competition between the models, the US and the Chinese models right now. And I think there is, economically, strategically, uh, 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 geopolitically. This doesn't mean that we're at war or going to go, go to war, but there's a competition. There's nothing wrong with recognizing competition. And, 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 the American model succeeded after 1945 internationally because its model of government and culture and democracy had a kind of credibility. But if that model now is represented by our Washington, then that's a war that we can only lose culturally. And I would think that the effectiveness of the Chinese model is going to look plausible in, in large swaths of the world. I may or may not like that. Right? Maybe as an American, I don't like that. As an academic, I remain value-free about it because uh, I want to look at it objectively. But I think that uh, one, one, should be, um, one should be honest and face up to this rather than fall back into the cozy op-ed pages of the New York Times and say that liberal democracy is healthy and all the evil is on the outside. Yeah. 
Yes, please. Okay. I just want to um, add a comment on what the student just said. I think, is it possible uh, to not look at the, the Chinese system and the American system as, as, as sort of consistent and coherent things, uh, but rather as clusters of different things that they do, right? So if we look at uh, them this way, probably we can, we can choose. Not everything that America is doing uh, uh, has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. Right and, and 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 also there are things that the Chinese are doing uh, that may make sense. Uh, I think the difference now, uh, because I shuttle back and forth between the two countries quite a bit, I, I feel like in 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 China, America is not seen as the ultimate other, at least culturally, technically. There 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 are so much to learn, like to absorb from everything, you know, here. Like uh, in terms of industry, in terms of whatever culture, government, but if we look at the, 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 the things that are happening here, um, whether it's in in, in you know, like in, in, journal, in the journalist circles or in academic circles, um, very little is done about China in the same way. Uh, people tend to kind of think that sort of it's just one system, and that system is the other. Somehow everything is contrastive. And uh, at a pragmatic level, probably um, that doesn't really help, you know, from my personal perspective. Would others on the panel care to respond to this? Well, thank you all very much for really uh, wonderful presentations. Um, I was quite struck that. Um, one of the themes running through almost all of them is, is this question of legitimacy and how, you know, in a way that I think points to the fact that, you know, all, rep all representative forms of government, uh, whatever, you know, their constitutional or political form, in some sense will always have a certain lack of legitimacy because you can never represent people in a sort of perfect way. There is no model that, that means you can represent both individuals and groups and the collective in any sort of way that satisfies everyone. But it's sort of built into, into representative government. Um, and then the question is how, what other expressions of uh, sort of popular sort of like needs and interests, but also civic consent to how people are governed, could there be? So in other words, the formal and the informal. So how the constitutions also accommodate something that can't be codified, that can't be formalized. And, and I think this is where culture comes in, because in some sense, what culture gives you is a sort of glue that holds it all together, <coughs> to use you know, a terrible phrase, because if you compare culture to glue, it's probably not very helpful. <laughs> But you know, the sort of social fabric, I suppose. Um, and isn't there then a problem with all models, be it Western liberal democracy or you know, other models around the world, where very often those models undermine the very sort of conditions, the very foundation on which they rest. So you could say what happens with liberal democracy is that it becomes increasingly liberalism without democracy. So democracy is more and more kind of marginalized and it's all about liberalism. You can all make social, cultural, identity liberalism, whichever you want. But it's not very democratic. And you could argue the same about, say, more uh, you know, state-based systems, where also you might say it might actually undermine the common culture. Because what you get in both systems in different ways is a disconnect between the needs of people. And what we haven't really, I think, been very successful at is to bridge that gap. And it's something that recurs in history. So I suppose the short question is: what's the role of constitutions in bridging the sort of disconnect between the needs and, and people? Because that Lack of legitimacy in representative government is always going to be there, and we're not very good at building bridges. I think in order to have greater legitimacy, greater consent, more participation in. Well, actually, I was uh, nodding my head thinking. What are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> David was doing just the same as you. <laughs> Especially in relation to the third tier, right? Yeah, well, I'm going to say something because I, I, you know, what I'm kind of trying to lay out is really thinking through specifically movements mm -hmm. as something we really have to theorize as part of constitutional theory, uh, because movements do represent a kind of way in which, um, you know, popular frustration mm -hmm. 
is able to express itself in a way that can or, or might not be able to transform institutionalized structures. And, and I, you know, what I was trying to suggest is that in the United States, uh, we've had a history in which uh, movements tend to have, um, you know, consequences for, you know, for larger structures. Now, this doesn't mean that it avoids conflict. I mean, you know, think about the abolition movement as leading to the Civil War, uh, obviously led to conflict, but um, it did also lead to a transformation of basic constitutional structures, right, amendments to the Constitution um, that changed the, the self-understanding of the American polity, uh, which, you know, I think most of us think in a good way, right? Uh, but, uh, but I, you know, but I think that in thinking through constitutional general, I mean, I, I don't think you need to be limited to the liberal democratic model, actually, in order to think through this, this dynamic of both um, uh, people on the one hand and then representation reform in the state on the other hand, and then um, as opposed to a, a, that form, a kind of a, some way of dealing with movements on the other hand. But, but probably in any case, it has to be some way to deal with movements, because movements are really, that's the, the whatever, that's always going to be the, the blind spot of any, of any order is going to uh, manifest itself in movements. With, with, with an eye toward the liberal the constitutional democracy, uh, I wonder if we could also maybe reframe the question slightly, see if this makes sense. If we're living in a time of constitutional crisis, either slope or in or soon uh, coming, uh, what are its cultural components? And does American liberal constitutionalism, constitutional theory, cultural theory, cultural and political processes have the power to uh, contain the repressive? Add to this, I think the, the suggestion in David's remark is that, is that movements are going to tend to be democratizing or popular over and against an, an elite. You're not going to have liberal movements against democracy, it's going to be the other direction. Maybe it's a thought experiment. Uh, and that you know, raises, I think, the very difficult question of uh, how we think about hierarchy. Uh, Predisposed to resist uh, any uh, any non-egalitarian claim, uh, but the the constitution of a society is going to be very much about the structure of its specific hierarchy and um, and, uh, and its uh, viability and productivity in a particular culture. These academics, where we're we're in a very difficult position to address this rhetorically, because our our shared ide ideology is egalitarian, but in fact we thrive on, on privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're really at the, um, at the at the crux of this of this uh, perpetual potential crisis in in any any political discussion. Jim, yeah, I would just say quickly. I I thoroughly agree with this. I don't. I, I'm not sure if this. It, I mean, it, it, to me, it's there. The United States Constitution begins in a. a widely a social movement of a unilateral declaration of independence by the colonies uh, in the imagination of a new community against rule by the crown, which in the Articles of Confederation is slapped together in whatever, 1777, and by hook or by crook, the, the war succeeds. That in turn is not, is partly democratic, but in many ways institutionalizes a great deal of in, in, in equality and, uh, you know, centrifugal forces. So the creation of the 1787 Constitution creates a strong world order, but embeds within it the seeds of the, 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 the next constitutional uh, convention in Montgomery, Alabama in 1861 leading to the CSA, so that there there, I think there is an organic uh, force of social movements for power, for uh, wealth, for sectional domination that's in, within the American Constitution, which often is usually been fought out within the structures of, you know, the three branches of the government, but it's not necessarily here. You can be in a way. So you're saying the American independence movement was a mistake? No, I'm saying it's a, uh, it's a social movement. They just didn't have, I mean, they had different clothes and music. We really have time for just two quick questions and answers before you. Yes. So, 
prompted by being flash marks. So if you ask me where is the uh, study of social reasons in American constitutional theory, I to try to send uh, mm -hmm. contemporary constitutional studies, constitutional theory, is very much, uh, at least part of it, very much focused on the role of social movements. The civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement. But they take a position that's a little different from yours, I think. Uh, uh, if we want to think about the distinction between constitution and constitutional law, all of the, uh, I believe, maybe I'm generalizing too much, um, that the theorist thing that what's at stake is the interpretation of constitutional law. Uh, and that these are movements making egalitarian claims primarily, and about interpretation uh, of uh, existing constitutional uh, law. Uh, I don't know any that think the movements are constitutional in the in this odd sense if we can make a distinction. So that makes me wonder whether you disagree with that, but it also makes me think that the Constitution is far more robust than anyone would judge uh, from uh, uh, this. Uh, and uh, whether that's a good thing or bad, uh, it, it, it seems to me that there's a, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a uh, pessimistic guy, but not like you people. <laughs> Unless you think that actually the distinction between constitution and constitutional law is itself something that we should reconsider, which would be my position. But yeah, yeah. you were this one. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really get to this, but I, I really wanted to emphasize the difference between and, and the strength of the American constitutional system um, in contrast to the German Weimar constitution, precisely because. Um, you have to think the American Constitution with a consciousness of the role of movements in American political life, whereas um, both the supporters of the Bonner Constitution and Schmidt, I think they they didn't, you know, they had this, well, I guess, legalist notion of the Constitution that really didn't um, take into account the role of movements and how movements are really need to be kind of have a proper place but not an improper place within the constitutional order. So I guess I'm not really pessimistic at all. I think I agree with you in the sense of the, the, the robustness of the American system, but not because of the, the, the letter of the Constitution, but the way in which the Constitution, I think we need to think of it beyond just constitutional law and think of it as the way that the people is constituted in terms of these three aspects, you know, the, the, you know, the people, the state representation, and then the movements, right? So, the, so I'll, I'll agree. I, I, I took David to be wildly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you, but you, but you'll have to continue this after, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all this, but I can't resist any longer. Uh, <laughs> I totally disagree with the interpretation. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs>